Hello. Sleep. <clears throat> then they came out of the narrow valley, and at once she saw the reason. There stood Peter and Edmund and all the rest of the Aslan's army fighting desperately against the crowd, that horrible creatures whom she had seen last night. Only now, in the daylight, they looked even stranger and more evil and more deformed. I stopped there. I'd been reading for an hour and sleep still didn't come. It was almost 2 a.m. Everyone else was asleep. I had my flashlight on under the sleeping bag and maybe the light was why I couldn't sleep, but I was too afraid to turn it off. I was afraid of how dark it was outside the sleeping bag. <clears throat> when we got back to our section in front of the movie screen, no one had even noticed we'd been gone. Mr. Tushman and Mr. Rubin, Miss Rubin and Summer and all the rest of the kids were just watching the movie. They had no clue how something bad had almost happened to me and Jack. It was so weird how that can be, how you could have a night that's the worst in your life, but to everybody else, it's just an ordinary night. Like on my calendar at home, I would mark this as being one of the most horrific days in my life. This and the day Daisy died. But for the rest of the world, this was just an ordinary day. And maybe it was a, even a good day. Maybe somebody won the lottery today. Amos, Smiles, and Henry brought me and Jack over to where we'd been sitting before. With Summer and Maya and Reed. And then they went and sat where they had been sitting before. With, Eg with Exmena and Savannah and their group. In a way, everything was exactly as we left it before we went looking for the toilets. The sky was the same. The movie was the same. Everyone's faces were the same. Mine was the same. <clears throat> but something was different. Something had changed. I could see Amos and Miles and Henry telling their group what had just happened. I knew they were talking about it because they kept looking over at me while they were talking. Even though the movie was still playing, people were whispering about it in the dark. News like that spreads fast. It was what everyone was talking about on the bus ride back to the cabins. All the girls, even the girls I didn't know very well, were asking me if I was okay. The boys were all talking about getting revenge on the group of seventh grade jerks trying to figure out what school they were from. I wasn't planning on telling the teachers about any of what had happened, but they found out anyway. Maybe it was the torn sweatshirt and the bloody elbow. Or maybe it was just that teachers hear everything. When we got back to camp, Mr. Tushman took me to the first aid office and while I was getting my elbow cleaned and bandaged up by the camp nurse, Mr. Tushman and the camp director were in the next room talking with Amos and Jack and Henry and Miles, trying to get a description of the troublemakers. When he asked me about them a little later, I said I couldn't remember their faces at all, which wasn't true. It's their faces I kept seeing every time I closed my eyes to sleep. The look of total horror on the girl's face when she first saw me. The way the kid with the flashlight, Eddie, looked at me as he talked to me like he hated me, like a lamb to the slaughter. I remember dad saying that ages ago, but tonight I think I finally got what it meant. Aftermath. Mom was waiting for me in front of the school along with the other parents when the bus, when the bus arrived. Mr. Tushman told me on the bus home that they had called my parents to tell them there had been a situation the night before and that everyone was fine. He said the camp director and several of the counselors went looking for the hearing aid in the morning while we all went swimming in the lake, but they couldn't find it anywhere. Briarwood would reimburse us the cost of the hearing aids, he said. They felt bad about what happened. I wondered if Eddie had taken my hearing aids with him as a kind of a souvenir, something to remember the orc. Mom gave me a tight hug when I got off the bus, but she didn't slam me with questions like I thought she might. Her hug felt good, and it didn't shake it, and I didn't shake it off like some of the other kids were doing with their parents' hugs. The bus driver started unloading our duffel bags, and I went to find mine while Mom talked to Mr. Tushman and Miss Rubin, who, walked, who had walked over to her. As I rolled my bag toward her, a lot of kids who I don't usually say anything to me were nodding hello or patting my back as I walked by them. Ready? Mom said when she saw me. She took my duffel bag and I didn't even try to hold onto it. It was fine for her to carry it. If she wanted to carry me on her shoulders, I would have been fine with that too, to be truthful. <clears throat> As we started to walk away, Mr. Tushman gave me a quick, tight hug, but didn't say anything. Home. Mom and I didn't talk much the whole walk home. And when we got to the first stoop, I automatically 
looked at the front bay window because I forgot for a second that Daisy wasn't going to be there like always, perched on the sofa with her front paws on the windowsills, waiting for us to come home. It made me kind of sad when we walked inside. As soon as we did, mom dropped my duffel bag and wrapped her arms around me and kissed me on the forehead and on my face like she was breathing me in. It's okay, mom, I'm fine, I said smiling. She nodded and took my hands in her hands, took my face in her hands. Her eyes were shiny. I know you are, she said. I missed you so much, Augie. I missed you too. I could tell she wanted to say a lot of things, but she stopped herself. Are you hungry, she asked, starving. Can I have a grilled cheese? Of course, she answered, and immediately started to make a sandwich while I took my jacket off and sat down on the kitchen counter. Where's Via, I asked. She's coming home with Dad today. Boy, did she miss you, Augie, Mom said. Yeah, she would have liked the nature reserved. reserve. You know what movie they played? The Sound of Music. You'll have to tell her that. So, do you want to hear about the bad part or the good part first? I asked after a few minutes, leaning my head on my, leaning my, head on my hand. Whatever you want to talk about, she answered. Well, except for last night, I had an awesome time, I said. I mean, it was just awesome. That's why I was so bummed. I feel like it ruined the whole trip for me. No, sweetie, don't let them do that to you. You were there for more than 48 hours, and that awful part lasted one hour. Don't let them take that away from you, okay? I know, I nodded. Did Mr. Tishman tell you about the hearing aids? Yes, he called us this morning. Was Dad mad because they're so expensive? Oh my gosh, of course not, Augie. He just wanted to know that you were all right. That's all that matters to us, and that you don't lose things, lose those, and you, that you don't let those thugs ruin your trip. I kind of laughed when she said the word thugs. What, she asked. Thugs? I teased her. That's kind of an old-fashioned word. Okay, jerks, morons, imbeciles, she said, flipping over the sandwich in the pan. Cretinos, as my mother would have said. Whatever you, whatever you want to call them. If I sell them on the street, I would have... She shook her head. That's pretty big, Mom, I smiled. They were pretty big, Mom, I smiled. Seventh graders, I think. She shook her head. Seventh graders? Mr. Tishman didn't tell us that. Oh, my goodness. Did he tell you how Jack stood up for me, I said. both. And Amos was like, bam, he rammed right into the leader. They both crashed to the ground, like in a real fight. It was pretty awesome. Amos's lip was bleeding and everything. He told us there was a fight, but she said, looking at me with her eyebrows raised, I'm just, phew, I'm just so grateful you and Amos and Jack are fine. When I think about what could have happened, she trailed off, flipping the grilled cheese again. My Montauk hoodie got totally shredded. Well, that can re be replaced, she answered. She lifted the grilled cheese onto the plate and put the plate in front of me on the counter. Milk or white grape juice? Chocolate milk, please, I said. I started devouring the sandwich. Oh, can you do it that special way you make it with the froth? How did you and Jack end up at the edge of the woods in the first place, she said, pouring milk into a tall glass. Jack had to go to the bathroom, I answered, my mouth full. As I was talking, she spooned the chocolate powder and started rolling a small whisk between her palms really fast. But there was a huge line and he didn't want to wait, so we went towards the woods to pee. She looked up at me while she was whisking. I know she was thinking we shouldn't have done that. The chocolate milk in the glass now had a two-inch froth on the top. That looks good, Mom. Thanks. And then what happened? She said, putting the glass in front of me. I took a long drink of chocolate milk. It's okay if we don't talk about it anymore right now. Is it okay if we don't talk about it anymore right now? Oh, okay. I promise I'll tell you all about it later when Dan and Via come home. I'll tell you all every detail. I just don't want to have to tell the whole story over and over, you know? Absolutely. I finished my sandwich in two more bites and gulped down the chocolate milk. Wow, you practically inhaled that sandwich. Do you want another one? I shook my head and wiped my mouth with the back of my hand. Mom, am I always going to have to worry about jerks like that? I asked. Like when I grow up, is it always going to be like this? She didn't answer right away, but took my plate and glass and put them in the sink and rinsed them with water. There are always going to be jerks in the world, Augie, she said, looking at me. But I really believe, and Daddy really believes, that there are more good people on this earth than bad people. And the good people watch out for each other and take care of each other, just like Jack was there for you and Amos and those other kids. Oh, yeah, Miles and Henry, I answered. They were awesome, too. It's weird because Miles and Henry haven't even really been very nice to me at all during the year. 
Sometimes people surprise us, she said, rubbing the top of my head. I guess. Want another class of chocolate milk? No, I'm good, I said. Thanks, Mom. Actually, I'm kind of tired. I didn't sleep too good last night. You should take a nap. Thanks for leaving me Babu, by the way. You get my note? She smiled. I slept with him both nights. She was about to say something else when her cell phone rang, and she answered. She started beaming as she listened. Oh, my goodness, really? What kind? She said excitedly. Yep, he's right here. He was about to take a nap. Want to say hi? Oh, okay, see you in two minutes. She clicked it off. That was Daddy, he sa she said excitedly. He and V are just down the block. He's not at work, I said. He left early because he couldn't wait to see you. She said, she didn't, so don't take a nap quite yet. Five seconds later, Dad and Via came through the door. I ran into Dad's arms, and he picked me up and spun me around and kissed me. He didn't let me go for a full minute until I said, Dad, it's okay. And then it was Via's turn, and she kissed me all over like she used to do when I was little. It wasn't until she stopped that I noticed the big white cardboard box they brought in with them. What is that? I said. Open it, said Dad, smiling, and she and Mom looked at each other like they knew a secret. Come on, Augie, said Via. I opened the box, and inside was the cutest little puppy I've ever seen in my life. It was black and furry, with a pointy little snout and bright black eyes and small ears that flopped down. Bear. We called the puppy Bear because when Mom first saw him, she said he looked just like a little cub bear. I said, that's what the, we should call him, and everyone agreed it was the perfect name. I took the next day off from school, not because my elbow was hurting me, which it was, but so I could play with Bear all day long. Mom let Via stay home from school too, so the two of us took turns cuddling with Bear and playing tug of war with him. We had kept all of Daisy's old toys, and we brought them out now to see which ones he liked best. It was fun hanging out with Via all day, just the two of us. It was like old times, like before I started going to school. Back then, I couldn't wait for her to come home from school so she could play before starting her homework. Now that we're older, though, and I'm going to school and have friends of my own that I, can hang, that I hang out with, we never do that anymore. So it was nice hanging, with, hanging out with her, laughing and playing. I think she liked it, too. The shift. When I went back to school the next day, the first thing I noticed was that there was a big shift in the way things were, a monumental shift, a, seis a seismic shift. Even, maybe even a cosmic shift. Whatever you want to call it, it was a big shift. Everyone, not just in our grade, but every grade had heard about what had happened to us with the seventh graders. So suddenly I wasn't known for what I always been known for, but for this other thing that had happened. And the story of what happened had gotten bigger and bigger each time it was told. Two days later, the, sto the way the story was that Amos had gotten into a major fist fight with the kid and Miles and Henry and Jack had thrown some punches at the other guys too. And the escape across the field became this whole long adventure through a cornfield maze and into the deep dark woods. Jack's version of the story was probably the best because he's so funny. But in whatever version of the story and no matter who was telling it, two things always stayed the same. I got picked on because of my face and Jack defended me. And those guys, Amos, Henry, and Miles protected me. And now that they could protect me, I was different to them. It, I was, it was like I was one of them. They all called me little dude now, even the jocks. These big dudes I barely even knew before would knuckle punch me in the hallways now. Another thing that came out of, of it was that Amos became super popular, and Julian, because he missed the whole thing, was really out of the loop. Miles and Henry were hanging out with Amos all the time now, like they'd switched best friends. <clears throat> I'd like to be able to say that Julian started treating me better too, but that wouldn't be true. He still gave me dirty looks across the room. He still never talked to me or Jack, but he was the only one who was like that now, and me and Jack couldn't have cared less. Ducks. The day before the last day of school, Mr. Tishman called me into his office to tell me that he had found out the names of the seventh graders from the nature retreat. He read off a bunch of names, that didn't mean anything to me. And then he said the last name, Edward Johnson. I nodded. You recognize that name, he said. They called him Eddie. Right. Well, they found that this in Edward's locker. He handed me what was left of the hearing aid, of my hearing aid headband. The right piece was completely gone and the left one was mangled. The band was connected 
that connected the two. The Lobot, Lobot part was bent down the middle. His school wants to know if you want to press charges, said Mr. Tushman. I looked at the hearing aid. No, I don't think so, I shrugged. I'm being fitted for new ones anyway. Hmm, why don't you talk to your parents tonight? I'll call your mom tomorrow to talk to her about it. Talk about it with her too. Would they go to jail, I asked? No, not jail, but they'd probably go to juvie court. And maybe they'll learn a lesson this way. Trust me, that Eddie kid is not learning any lessons, I joked. He sat down behind his desk. Augie, why don't you sit down for a second, he said. I sat down. All the things on his desk were the same as when I first walked into his office last